All right. Uh, welcome back, uh, Valley Free Radio listeners. And I'd like to welcome our Northampton community television audience. This is Rick Haggerty kicking it for peace, culture, and education right here at Valley Free Radio, airing each Sunday morning from 8 to 10 a.m. and replaying 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. on Thursday evening. Thank you, uh, Northampton Community Television, uh, uh, for being with us. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome welcome our guest, uh, Crystal Zivon. How are you this morning, Crystal? I'm pretty good. All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being my guest today. Uh, we're so excited to have you. And uh, we've uh, we've only got a half hour and there's so much to talk about. So uh, uh, thanks for remembering the uh, spring forward as well for being on time. So uh, so I'd like to kick it off by just, uh, you know, continuing or, or reflecting back on our conversation uh, when I met you last week at Valley Free Radio. And that was uh, how you started off uh, as being uh, a friend to the councils and uh, moving from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast. Could you tell uh, tell that story uh, to my listeners and uh, television audience? Sure. Um, well, I graduated from high school in 1967. There you have my age. And, um, and was supposed to go to Bennington College. And um, I got to Vermont uh, where a boyfriend of mine was working uh, in the kitchen making pizzas in a, a nightclub called the Blue Tooth in Sugarbush, Vermont. And um, I ended up taking over his job, and that seemed like a lot more fun than going to college at that age <laughs> in the 60s. Sure. And so I, um, and then the house band that was hired for that winter was a band called Twice Nicely. Um <clears throat> And the lead guitar player, the leader of the band, was Wadi Wachtel, which any serious rock and roll aficionados will recognize the name. He's one of the most well-known studio musicians, guitar players in the business, and has played with and toured with most of the luminaries in the rock and roll. Um, Anyway, he became my boyfriend. And um, Wadi had taught uh, guitar to this family in Newport, Rhode Island, the Cowsills. And this is before they were were known, but he had taught them how to play their instruments. So we went through that winter, and towards the end of the winter, um, Bud Cowsill, the father of the family, came up to Vermont and heard the band, and wanted to take them all out to L.A. Uh, they had had their first hit, the Cowsels, um, with the rain, the park, and other things. I love the flower girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great song, um, yeah. And <clears throat> so, so, you know, they were off and running, and we're all moving out to California. And, and um, so he thought that he could get a deal and make this band famous. And so I went with them and worked for the Cowsels. That was my, I was 19 by the time I got to L.A. And um, working in a, had my own office with a door and nice. couch and a desk and everything <laughs> in a high rise in Beverly Hills on Sunset, 9255 Sunset Boulevard. Very and nice. um you know, what the main part of my job was really was running their fan club. <laughs> yeah. We and, published the and that was, fan newspaper. And, sure. And that yeah. was 1968? That was 1968. Yeah. And, um, and you know, during that time, they had the huge hit with uh, hair. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the people, people knew the song, but the song that you most often heard on the on the radio was hair by the Cowsels. Yeah, that was great, great too. Um, and so so that got us to to Beverly Hills. It was the Cowsel family themselves, the, the series The Partridge Family, which most people know if you don't know the Cowsels, uh, was, was written for them. Um, but unfortunately, Bud, the dad, had a 
pretty serious drinking problem and uh, and an anger problem. He the family lived in this compound in Santa Monica, and um, he ran a tight ship. And um, but he blew the deal. Oh boy! Wow! And yeah, so so they did not do that, and from there things started to fall apart. Uh, the whole structure fell apart. The oldest one of the councils was Billy, um, family member, and Billy was married to a woman named Karen, and they lived in a guest house on this property in Santa Monica. And uh, uh, Billy kind of was, I think, the first to take off. He and his father got into serious confrontations and he he moved out now he had and, been at uh, brown is that right uh, i'm sorry uh, was bill uh, were bill and john uh st- students at brown at one point was that uh, prior to going out to to uh to la uh was that uh uh or, or maybe uh maybe i didn't get that right i don't i don't remember bill ever being a student at brown oh, okay but, um he was a, uh, maybe they played there. I think they did some frat parties there, but that was the, that was yeah. what I had read. Yeah. Um, you know, he was a good guy. He and his wife had a baby, and and yeah. um, uh, but he he had serious issues with his with his dad, and um, and so it it sort of there were no. rumbles. But I anyway, s- yeah, that's sure. how I got to California, <laughs> and, yeah, that's and how that's my story of the council. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. It's a great story, and and I guess the uh, um, the saving grace was that even though you know the Partridge family, you know they didn't get that uh, um, that contract. I understand they played uh, an average of two hundred performance dates per year from sixty eight through seventy two. So so they right. uh, you know they put themselves out there uh, just oh, yeah. just the same. So um, they had big shows in Las Vegas, and you know it was a. Uh they were, they were big. They were the singing family. You know, the mom and and Susan was seven years old, I think, at that time when they first started. Yeah, yeah. The daughter. I, I love those uh, YouTube videos of the cow sills uh, with Susan uh, chiming in, and you know, just a great talent. I mean, they they had uh, um, Indian Lake as well, and uh, yep. you know, many great many great songs. So um, so let's um, uh, you know follow uh, your story because uh, as you mentioned you know Wadi uh, was involved with uh, Warren as well so he uh, uh, he was hired by Warren in 72 is that correct yeah Warren was uh, the band leader for the Everly Brothers at that time and you know the, as the story goes Wadi knew everything that the Everly Brothers ever did and Wadi was just uh, you know oh, nice total, total fan of the Everly Brothers. And he got uh, an audition. Warren was auditioning people for a band to go on the road. And um, and he auditioned for Warren. And I can't remember the song that they... Uh, that, 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 they that he had to play at the audition. But anyway, Warren had it wrong. Warren was not playing it right. <laughs> was it uh, Stories We Could Tell? Or it was on that album, uh, maybe something from that? or um, You know, I honestly don't remember. No, it's one okay. of the standard songs. It might have been, you know, Wake Up Little Wake Susie up little or Susie. Bye Bye Love or, yeah, you know, okay. a standard song. And, and um, um, he Wadi, messed it that's up. That's not how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, In the end of his audition. And Warren was furious. And he said, oh, but you know, Wadi played it correctly, and and um, and then Warren sort of said, "Well, Big Shot, you know so much. What's this?" And he, I can't remember what he played, but he played something like a Beethoven piece or something, something that Wadi, who didn't know classical music at all, uh, but it was happened to be the one thing he knew and <laughs> named it, and so he got the job. Nice <laughs> playing for the Everly Brothers. I can't. I, I, the details of that story are they're actually in my books, but I can't remember what they are right now. Oh, fantastic. Um, but it was it was very funny. So so uh yeah, uh they went on the road and um 
on one of their early tours, I picked Wadi up at the airport coming back from tour. Um, I had this Chevy Super Sport van, and and um, he asked if we could give Warren a ride to the Tropicana, uh, which was the motel where all the rock and roll people stayed, and there was a coffee shop, 24-hour coffee shop called Duke's where everybody hung out and you know after recording sessions got out in the middle of the night people would go in there and <clears throat> anyway Tom Waits practically lived there and uh, he was down the street from the Troubadour um, anyway so so we he was Warren was splitting up from his the mother of his son Jordan and and so we were supposed to drop him off at the Tropicana. And um, and Wadi and I are in the front seat and Warren's in the back seat. And, and um, Wadi's rolling a joint, you know, it was the 60s. <laughs> and, um, and Warren and I, our, our eyes met in the rearview mirror and something sparked. There was just a spark. I wow. Don't know. Wow, that's and, awesome. And then I was passing the joint around the car, you know, uh, when he passed it to me, our fingers touched and lingered and, you know, nice. the sparks ignited. <laughs> and, you know, over the course of the next couple of weeks, it was like everywhere I went, this was Los Angeles, you know, we're in a major city, but I went to the dentist and I heard a voice out in the waiting room and it was Warren. And, you know, we connected there. I went to the grocery store shopping for Thanksgiving and and down the aisle comes Warren. <laughs> uh, destined to be, huh? <laughs> Just everywhere we went, um, there we were. And uh, anyway, we ended up at a nightclub where Wadi, <clears throat> Wadi had a, and some friends used to play every Friday night called, it was called Benny K's on Santa Monica Boulevard. And they got $10 a piece. To, but they could play whatever they wanted as loud as they wanted and and, um, and Warren showed up at this gig and you know we sat next to each other we danced we kissed and that was that we, uh, wonderful wow what a great story that's so, fantastic so um, oh and uh, I do want to remind folks uh, if you just tuned in we're speaking with uh, Crystal Zevon um, and uh, we're enjoying this uh, rich conversation. She is Warren Zevon's ex-wife and widow, friend of the 60s group The Cow Sills, and writer of the acclaimed oral history about Warren's career and personal life, I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. And we're also going to be discussing uh, uh, their daughter, uh, Ariel Zevon's uh, debut album, The Detangler. Uh, this is WXOJ 103.3 FM Northampton, streaming online at valleyfreeradio.org. So... Um, that was uh, an absolutely wonderful story and, uh, um, you know, um, tragic that, you know, that, uh, that Warren died uh, so young. Um, but you were, um, after having been uh, divorced and, and all, um, called upon. And do you want to talk about uh, how that uh, came to be? Um. You mean to write the book? Yes, yes, uh, yeah. I mean, okay. uh, yeah, such yeah. a great. I mean, we're kind of fast forwarding, but uh, right. with limited well, time, uh, I thought Warren we. Warren and I yeah. stayed friends. Um, you know, we got through the divorce, and <clears throat> and the truth is, probably we were much better friends than we were uh, a couple. We were we were both emotional people, and <laughs> we had. <laughs> You know, it was a volatile relationship. We had, I mean, it was a great love, and I wouldn't trade it for anything, but um, it had many ups and downs. Anyway, when Warren was diagnosed um, with lung cancer, and, you know, it, he was he was going to die. I mean, it was not a... It was too far advanced to, to uh, consider even treatment as far as he was concerned. So um, he and I started talking. We talked several times a day for for a long time at the beginning uh, after his diagnosis. And he asked me to write his story after he died. Um, he 
talk to Carl Hyacin, who is the writer of Florida detective stories and ecologist and so on. And Carl was kind of his best friend, and, and Carl wrote the, the foreword to my book. Um, but Carl told him that I was, he agreed with him that I should be the one to do it. So, you know, he was dying, and I, you know, you don't say no to something like that, but I don't think I really considered what that meant yeah. until he yeah. actually did die. <clears throat> and then suddenly there I was, an ex-wife of maybe 26 years, um, with this promise I made. He called me the the week before he died, and, and he said, so you're going to do this thing right? And I said, well, yeah, Warren, I guess so. I, um, and he said, he said, well, you've got to tell the whole truth. Uh, and I said, well, I don't know if I know what the whole truth is. He laughed, and he said, um, well, you'll find out. <clears throat> and um, and he said and and he said you have to even tell the awful ugly parts because that's the excitable boy who wrote them excitable songs. And <clears throat> you know there were plenty of ugly parts. Warren was a, a serious alcoholic who had you know uh, there was a lot of violence and and anger and um, you know he had a difficult upbringing. Uh, his father was a gangster. His mother was a Mormon. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, you know, I had been a battered wife, I mean, to be perfectly and, and it was like, well, now how do I do this without sounding like, uh, you know, a grudging ex-wife? Um, and I, you know, I wrestled with it for quite a while and, and then I realized that it, I could just interview people. There were so many people in his life. Warren was um, extremely well thought of by other musicians. He was a musician's musician. And um, and he had an amazing story. He had a lot of amazing stories. So I just started from, and I knew, you know, everyone from his childhood and so on. So I just started doing interviews. And um, and I wrote an oral history that came out, you know, I mean, it came out really well. I couldn't have been happier with the way it came out. I wrote a lot of narrative in, in the middle to kind of find a way to piece it together because it was a huge puzzle. But, um, but I let the story be told by a lot of different people, from very famous people. Warren loved books and writers, and, and so there were a lot of, you know, from Stephen King to Carl Hyas and Mick, Mitch Album, um, Amy Tan, a lot of people like that that he, he knew, then girlfriends and roadies, and, you know, he had... There, there were stories from everywhere. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. And uh, and it came out, yeah. It's, I mean, it's been, it was, it, it did very well. It still sells, and um, and okay. I'm yeah, I'm proud of it. Yeah, wonderful. I'd like to read a, a short quote. I mean, there's so much, <clears throat> but the uh, the New York Times article, it ain't that pretty. That life of Zivon's, um, and uh, Janet Maslin. Uh, wrote about your work, and uh, she said, quote, but her affection, candor, and dogged pursuit of information make this book an unforgettable journey into the depths of Mr. Zivon's mad genius. There is much for Miss Ms. Zivon to balk at, but she has the temerity for this tough job. So, uh, you know, it really, uh, I'm sure Warren would have been thrilled you know, at uh, at what you did, you know, and that and it wasn't easy. No, it wasn't easy, but um, I'm glad I did it, and and yeah, I think I did what he asked me to do. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it sounds. Uh, I can't wait to get a hold of it. You know, it's uh, um, it just sounds amazing. Now, um, that uh, uh, another thing that was. Uh, that Maslin uh, talks about is, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the darkness and, uh, uh, you know, having the lack of uh, show business uh, 
uh, artifice, um, and and that make that again that just making it uh, so telling in that 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 you know that he wanted that, um, and uh, talks a little bit about Jackson Brown and Neil Young, people close to Warren, and um, you know and all that, and and uh, discussing uh, his even discussing the funeral. Um, and Jackson Brown saying, my role as benefactor took its toll on our friendship, um, uh, but it was a friendship that endured to the end of Mr. Zivon's days. Um, and uh, uh, Jackson said uh, that Warren, quote unquote, had literary muscle. So a lot has been said about uh, Warren's writing ability and the uh, excellence of that. Yeah, um, and Jackson was my daughter Ariel's godfather, so um, she had the benefit of two really pretty great musicians uh, growing up uh, as influences. And yes, Ab- absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, we uh, uh, I, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Ariel and her work. Um, how would you like to close the, uh, uh, our conversation about, uh, uh, about your book and, uh, how, how can folks get a hold of the book? How about that? What's, uh, what's the best you way? Know, to... yeah, I mean, it's, it's available. I don't know that it's on bookstore, st- bookstore shelves. Yes. Uh, so readily now because it's been out for a while, but it's, you, you can get it through, uh, Powell books or Amazon. Um, it's. It's out there, or eBay. <laughs> Get a used copy. Um, it's it's definitely still still available. Yeah, so. Man, fantastic. Um, all right, all right. So uh, now um, Ariel is uh, your daughter and Warren's daughter, and you mentioned that uh, she has new music, and uh, sounds like. Um, uh, after uh, being alone and uh, raising her two young boys that uh, I read uh, um, in the uh, Burlington uh, Press that she found something she had long put aside, and that is uh, writing songs. And right. uh, I, I gave a listen uh, to, uh, to some of her music, and it sounds just fantastic. I mean, uh, uh, you must be so proud. I am. I, you know, I mean, <clears throat> there's always a, it, it, to have the the offspring of someone who is considered a great talent, like Warren is in in his own right. Um, it, it, there's always it's always difficult. You know, I always think of Julian Lennon, who's quite talented and but can't not be compared to his father. Um, so there, you know, there's always that little bit of hesitation, and and Ariel had that hesitation. Um, <clears throat> so she kind of wrote songs just for herself, for her own pleasure, um, alone. Nobody heard them. I mean, many of the songs that were on that album, I had never heard um, the CD she just released. Um, but you know, it's just something she'd do in the quiet of her home. She lives off grid in Vermont, and. And she's a farmer, you know, and she she loves that life. Um, she pretty much shunned. She she studied acting in college, and and um, she kind of after spending some time in L.A. doing the audition thing and you know <laughs> um, getting parts and getting rejections, <clears throat> she. She decided that wasn't for her, and she wanted to raise her children in Vermont. Um, but but she kept writing songs, and um, and during the Syrian refugee crisis, actually, she had a song called "Refugee Without a Nation," and she just was in, She just sort of decided to put it on the SoundCloud version on on YouTube that she just did in her in her little house on a piano. And um, a friend of ours, uh, Christina Stykos, who has a studio in Chelsea, Vermont, uh, heard it and said, Ariel, let's record this. <laughs> anyway, that little 
so they did, and, and it, she said, what else do you have? And pretty soon they had a, well, not pretty soon, over a couple of years <laughs> of recording, they had a, a CD, which they released, and, you know, Christina knew a lot of great musicians. Uh, Jackson's guitar player is, is on it. He, he comes to Vermont and knew Christina. And there are a lot of really fine musicians on it. And um, so she released her first CD, and she just, she, she's writing more songs and, you know, starting to play live a little bit. Um, but, you know, she's... Fantastic, yeah. She's over 40, and she waited until she, you know, it's not, she's not, she's not looking to get rich and famous. She's, uh, <laughs> she's doing it because she loves doing it. Wow, that's wonderful. And, uh, and if people enjoy it, great. Now uh-huh. she that that's such a great uh, approach uh, to music. And now uh, I understand she grew up uh, uh, studying uh, classical flute. Is that is that correct? She did, yes. Yeah, and uh, she was fond of, I guess, uh, uh, Warren uh, playing uh, Beethoven records and reading the score while listening. Is that uh, is that correct? Yeah. 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 So she had a fine ear, I guess, for uh, an intellect for music. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Fancy. Yeah, she did. <clears throat> um, you know, it's in her blood. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I think she'll keep, keep going with it. By the way, just if anybody's interested in the CD, you can, you can get it on cdbaby.com, I think. Yeah, cdbaby.com. And that's the detangler. And that's Ari- Ariel Zivon. So yep. uh, definitely, uh, definitely look that up. Uh, you'll be uh, very pleased. It's uh, uh, that's it's great music, um, and her own music. Um, although you know, I mean, there's uh, um, I can you know hear Warren's influence, and but it's uh, Ariel's music, and that's uh, I think that's very important to her. And she said, I think part of detangling was maybe. Uh, uh, from a relationship and, you know, maybe uh, standing on her own two feet with her music, I suppose. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, uh, that's fantastic. And, um, uh, is it, uh, am I correct in that she's, um, uh, moving on to, uh, uh, she's starting, uh, another, uh, uh, effort with her music, another, uh, uh she's gonna... um, yeah, she's, <clears throat> she kind of partnered with it. <laughs> A friend from from when we we had a farm fresh market and cafe in Barrie, Vermont, and a guy who was on the board who's a farmer and a stonemason, <laughs> but he also plays guitar and writes songs, and and he was uh, actually doing some stonework for her out at her place, and so they just started playing a little bit together and. They are now forming a group. They call themselves the Grackles. And um, they're going to play live at the Kingdom Tap Room in St. Johnsbury on March 31st, I guess, will be their first. They did play on the first night. They started a sort of rock opera called Marshland. Um, so, you know, they're experimenting with, with that now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So she's 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 very uh, nervous about playing live. She says, as an actor, it was easy. I could get up on stage and I'm playing somebody else. But when you get up with your music, you are totally exposing yourself and who you are and you know your deepest feelings and emotions. So, sure, um, sure. It's she's getting she's getting more relaxed, but it's not easy. <laughs> right, right. That's fantastic. Well, um, and you're uh, you're enjoying life in uh, Vermont. Uh, yeah, we. What I've done yeah, is that books, we've taken uh, more. Ariel has wanted... donated Warren's library. Yes, Warren had a okay. vast library. Yeah, and, and so I'm selling books on eBay, Warren's Yvonne's library, uh, to benefit a an Abenaki cultural center um, that we're trying to preserve. Wonderful. From the Abenaki culture here, and yeah. Warren's books are are serving that purpose. And do you want to spell that so people know uh, the well, Abenaki? The, you yeah, can go Abenaki. on Facebook, and it's it's hard. It's Nulhegan, N-U-L-H-E-G-A-N, 
and then Abenaki, A-B-E-N-A-K-I, Cultural Center. And um, it's on eBay, but, but it, there's also a, a page on Facebook or, called uh, Warren Zevon's Library. Nice, nice. And you can, you can find it all there. Oh, that's so wonderful. Um, well, we're... Uh, we're just about out of time. I just, I don't know where the time went. This is such a fascinating story. And uh, I want to thank you, Crystal, so much uh, for coming on my show to discuss, uh, uh, you know, your, uh, your life, uh, you know, with the councils and, and getting, meeting Warren and your life with Warren and this wonderful book, um, I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, that you, uh, you wrote to, uh, you know, uh, um, satisfaction of uh, so many um, and uh, to you know look forward uh, now to uh, Ariel's music and her involvement um, with that and then uh, uh, this book uh, book sale of Warren Zevon's uh, book library to support such a good cause um, well, how would you like to uh, close um, well <laughs> thank you for having me I mean it's it's uh it's always fun to talk about it, and I, you know, I hope people will continue to listen to Warren's music and um, check out Ariel's CD. Um, you know, the legacy goes on. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I've been, I've prom- been promoting both <laughs> and listening to. As you know, I, you know, the uh, <clears throat> Excitable Boy was uh, during my uh, college years, and I fell in love with every song on that uh, on that album. Um, and uh, very much enjoy. I'm very much enjoying Ariel's music as well. So, well, I'm glad uh, glad you're doing well. And uh, thanks again. Thank and, you for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure, Crystal. Have have a great day. And okay, uh, you too. I hope to have Ariel on uh, yeah, to talk she'd about her music. Yeah, love to come on. Oh, that's, I'm sure she'd love to come on. That that's fantastic. All right. Have, thanks again. Take care now. Oh, all right. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, Crystal Zevon, what a great guest. And uh, I've got so much more for you today. Uh, Let's go with um, uh, just thanking our Northampton Community Television audience for tuning in. Thank you to Al Williams and all the folks there that make this possible. And again, uh, Rick Haggerty, kicking it for peace, culture, and education, airing each each Sunday morning. 3.3 3.3 FM Northampton streaming online at valleyfreeradio.org. So uh, let's uh, end it right there. Uh, for the- <laughs>